This is a pirate ship. No, no, it's not. This is a replica of a pirate ship. No, no, it's not that either. This is a replica of a ship from the same time period as pirate. No, it's not. All right, look, pirating really took off in the golden age between the late 1600s and the early 1700s. This ship is from the late 1800s. It's a couple hundred years off. I'm going with what I got. Work with me here. It's the history of pirate food. Ahoy, mateys. So piracy has been around basically as long as humans have been sailing, and it's still around to this day in certain parts of the world. And while the Golden Age may have ended in the early 1700s, it was still a very big industry well through the 1800s, which means this ship behind me may not be too far off from some of the ones that were actually used. So let's go explore it. I'm at the South Street Seaport, New York's home for sailing history. It's got a museum, it hosts the Festival of Tall Ships, and it has several ships you can explore to see what daily life was like for the sailors. The main staple of any sailor's diet is, of course, hardtack. Hardtack or ship's biscuits are what are frequently called fearsomely durable biscuits made basically just out of flour and water and baked until all of the moisture has left them. They're kind of like a uh, ship's cracker, sort of. They have no flavor, they're really hard. People used to joke that they would crack your teeth. At the beginning of the trip, maybe they weren't so bad, but by the end of the trip, by the time you'd been on the ocean for a couple of months, they were almost always infested with weevils and maggots. Uh, some of the other food that they would have in the larder like this would have been dry goods, most notably beans. Sailors ate a lot of beans, but the problem of eating that on a ship where you're surrounded by water is of course the moisture. Moisture sets in, there's really nothing you can do about it, and it almost always goes rotten. So we all know that pirates were a drunken crew and that any communal meal, of course, would have had to have involved lots of alcohol, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Remember, at this point in time, fresh water was tough to find even on land, let alone in the middle of the ocean. And even if you did get it, it would be tough to keep it fresh because they didn't have great ways to seal jars and uh, other containers to keep and any kind of airborne pests out. Plus, don't forget, most different kinds of alcohol have a lot of calories in them, things like beer, things like wine. Those are pretty calorically dense. So making sure that your crew got lots of alcohol was actually a good way to make sure that they had enough calories to keep them going throughout the day. And those pirates needed a lot of calories. Sailing a tall ship is tough work. Just look at the ropes. They're almost exactly the same size as my arm. Pirate captains sometimes dined a little better than their crews. The most successful pirate captain was Bartholomew Roberts, the legendary Black Bart. He only drank tea, not liquor, and his favorite dish was the pirate classic Salmagundi, which is basically a hodgepodge stew of vegetables like cabbage and whatever meat was available, like turtle, anchovies, and pigeon. In fact, it was his last meal. He was in the middle of eating a plate of it when his ship was attacked by, I kid you not, the HMS Swallow. Ironic, isn't it? Which brings me to my favorite captain. One of the most famous pirate captains from the late 1600s to the early 1700s was William Dampier. He was an Englishman, he was a sailor, he was a gentleman, but most importantly, he was a foodie. He traveled the world and he ate everything he could find. He got to Australia 80 years before Captain Cook did. He crossed the Panama Isthmus on foot and everywhere he went, he found new weird things to eat and bring back home. He introduced Europe to things like soy sauce, tortillas, barbecue, breadfruit. He even wrote down what was quite possibly the first English recipe for guacamole. Because of the length of time these ships spent out at sea, they often brought livestock on board with them. Frequently it was chicken, sometimes it was goats, sometimes it was cows. They would use them for eggs or milk during the trip, and then when they started running out of food to give them, they would kill the animals and eat them. And yes, that does mean, in order to be historically accurate, any pirate ship that you see in TV or movies should technically have livestock on it. So, if anyone out there from Disney is watching this, looking for the next big blockbuster, hear me out. Pirates of the Cow Ravine. They could have like one of the spots over their eyes, just like an eye patch. They could still have a parrot hanging out on one of the, the horns. I mean, it practically writes itself. The pirate cows, who I like to imagine also had peg legs and mooed with an accent, were kept down below. You know, the part of the ship that gets the hottest and has no ventilation. I'm sure it smelled great. 
The beef that they did have on board had to be preserved to keep it from going rancid during the trip. So the chefs would often salt and dry it to stretch the life as long as possible. But when I say dry, I don't mean just a little bit chewy. I mean it was the consistency of leather. The sailors referred to it as black oak and often carved it into belt buckles and buttons. Of course, all of that is just the best case scenario. When they ran aground, or if they got blown off course, or if they got stuck in a lull in the ocean where they didn't have enough wind to move the boat forward, then things started to get pretty desperate. We have records of some sailors shredding their leather satchels and frying and eating the leather, and in some cases it got even worse than that. Uh, when female pirate captain Charlotte Duberry ran aground, she resorted to cannibalism and ate her husband. Hey Cap, what do you look for in a man? I want a man who's soft and tender and tastes good with barbecue sauce. That's not weird at all.